Uh, Romans chapter 4, again, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he'd been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the, the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith, and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Pray again for the, the preaching and hearing of his word. Father God, as we seek to um, go deeper into these words, um, comparing scripture to scripture, um, having even looked into what fathers of the faith have said in years past about these passages, and as we pray together and, and look into this, to say, oh Lord, what do you have to say to us here this morning that we might become more like you? Even that others who may not know you might hear. And, and, and as faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, that some may even be converted even this morning, we thank you for your promised blessing upon the preaching and hearing of your word. The same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. Your purposes will be accomplished. We pray blessing upon this time, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, some of you like um, to take notes, which is okay. Um, some of you just like to kind of know where something's going. So here we go. I have my timer set. This is a six-point sermon. Here they are. Wrath, rest, life, growth, glory, assurance. Wrath, rest, life, growth, glory, assurance. And you might not like six-point sermons. We'll be here too long. So you can consider this a three-point sermon. And the three points are these. One, wrath and rest. Two, life and growth. Three, glory and assurance. If you prefer just the one-point sermon, wrath, rest, life, growth, or assurance. That's what the sermon's about today, and this is what, because this is what the passage is talking about. What we seek to do is to exegete the passage. Eisegete is to read into it what we want to, and you can find scriptures. If you want to talk about something, you can find some scripture you know, and I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. So you can you can dig into the scriptures and find put into it what you want. The 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 secret, which is no secret, the mystery of the Holy Spirit. What He does is to say, dig out of this what's there and apply it to your life and to your church and to yourself. That we want to know what does God say to us 
from the scripture, which means get out of the way. Get out of the way, because he's going to say things to you, say things to me that uh, uh, that's not, it's not what I want to hear. Maybe it's going to be what you need to hear. Sometimes it'll be exactly what you need to hear, but our hearts are fickle and deceitful. So what we do is, by the Holy Spirit, please illumine our hearts to this God-breathed scripture. So Paul, as we keep going through Romans, will just not leave this point alone. It, it's very important to him, and therefore it's, it's important to us that justification is by faith alone. We are not, and no one ever has been, no one ever is, no one will be justified, in other words, declared righteous by God by works of the law or by being good. Romans 3.12, no one does good. No, not one. So there goes that. So if that's what you're basing your hope on, get the t-shirt, Romans 3.12. It's not even, doesn't even need the context. It's clear. No one does good. No, not one. So how are we saved? From God's wrath over our sin. Remember, we're saved from God. We need to be saved from God. And if that's the case, who can save you but God? And that's what God does. He says, my own strong right arm worked salvation. And we're saved from God's wrath over our sin through faith in Jesus Christ. He takes our sin to the cross. He has accounted sin on the cross so that we might be accounted the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Some people call it the great exchange. It says, for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus. So for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus was not sinful on the cross, but he became sin. It was credited to him. And so when he died, the sins of the believers were set on him. And in that same way, we don't, necess- we don't become righteous, but we are credited. We are counted righteous in the same way that Jesus had sin laid on him. We have laid upon us the righteousness of God. And that's justification. You are declared righteous, an act of God's grace and mercy because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay, we got it. That's a lot of stuff right there. That's big theology, simple theology. That's, that's the gospel. Wrath, rest, life, glory, growth, assurance. First, wrath, verses 13 through 15. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world, not just that he would inherit it, but that he would be the one to whom the inheritance is going to come because Jesus is going to come from his line as well. But the faith of Abraham, where he becomes the father of the faithful, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherent, if it is the adherence of the law, so people who are keeping the law, it's talking about the Jews particularly, but anybody who's trying to be brought into the presence of God through doing good, even if it's the things that God declares to be right and good, so if it is the adherence of the law who are to be the heirs, then faith is null and the promise is void. So there is no promise without faith. So you cannot even begin to think that even the Jewish person who may be depending on the law for their good standing, he's telling them, no, it's only faith. And so we have to tell ourselves that. So the question becomes, then what's the, what's the purpose of the law? What, what do I have to, you know, do I have anything to do with the law? And he says, well, yeah, here it is. Verse 15, the law brings wrath. <laughs> the law brings wrath. And that's wrath. Why? Because the wrath of God is the penalty for sin. And Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if the law brings wrath, and he goes on here, he also says, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So we're going to do two things with that. One is, but there is a law, so there is transgression. Transgression being this word, the word transgress and trespass, they're two different words in Greek, but they kind of mean the same thing like trespass and transgress does do in English. 
which is like, you know what a no trespassing sign is? It's that thing that you ignore when you go hunting. But you shouldn't. So there's like a, there's a border somewhere, and you step over that border, you are trespassing. You are stepping over a boundary that was defined as, no, you also can transgress something. It can mean you're on the proper way, but you, you go off that path. So these two ideas are inherent um, in, this, in this idea. So you, you have broken a boundary that's been set. You have crossed over this thing. So there's a law, 55. Everybody knows what I mean by that. Maybe a thousand years from now, they'll be like, oh, it's like they're still going to be listening to me in a thousand years. What do you mean by that? 55, the last step of sanctification is driving the speed limit. So you transgress, you trespass when you violate a law. And therefore, the law brings wrath. Because there is law. There is transgression. We have all sinned, and we all deserve wrath. So therefore, keeping your law does not bring God's love Keeping the law does not bring his forgiveness. It doesn't bring his favor. It doesn't bring his benefits. It doesn't bring his mercy. It doesn't bring his grace. Keeping the law brings wrath. Now, there's going to be another aspect of that where keeping the law brings blessing. But we're not talking about that yet. We'll get to that in a minute. But for right now, keeping the law unto salvation, keeping the law to earn your good standing with God, keeping the law in order to be able to say, why should I let you in? You say, look at it out. Look how I kept the law. I mean, it won't take but a second to, one, demonstrate, well, first, you're born in sin. You have, you, you have a problem there. But second, you ever told a lie? You ever done, the, you, ever, you know, what? Just, do you want the record played on the big screen TV in front of everybody? Uh, no, it won't take long before we're condemned as guilty by the law. But also, in this context, where in this context was there no law? So what he says, the, the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So if you look back at verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heirs of the world did not come through the law. So when Abraham is being promised to be the heir of the world, he is being promised that before the coming of the law, the Mosaic law. And his, but you're like, but wait a minute, Adam and Eve, they're sin. Yes, that's why his faith was counted to him, credited to him, imputed to him as righteousness. So he has been credited with righteousness and is promised heir of the world. That promise, there's no law involved with that, so he can't transgress it. He can't violate that promise. There's, it's, it's, <clears throat> there's nothing he has to do to keep that promise. It is called an unconditional promise to Abraham. So there's no law there, so there's no transgression. There's just faith. And so what Paul is saying is to us as well, it's like you are saved by faith, not by law, not by doing good. Second, rest. Verse 16. <clears throat> That's why it depends on faith. The promise that he's the heir. In order that the promise may rest on grace. So this is the rest. The promise rests on grace. And will be guaranteed to all his offspring, which he's already said is Jew and Gentile, those who had the faith of Abraham, those who believe God, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. So the promise rests on grace. And so the world used the word grace a little bit different. Like, you know, she did that with great grace. Um, she has grace. She's grace. You know, these things, it's like, yeah, okay, that's one way we use the word grace. But grace is God particularly giving something to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Not only does he not deserve it, but they deserve wrath. And instead of wrath, they get love and blessing. It could be like a child breaks your window. And I've been on both sides of this equation. A child breaks your window and told 50 times, don't do it. 
And they were doing something bad when they did it. And they did it for a bad reason. I'm going to multiply the thing. Maybe it wasn't a child, maybe it was somebody else. But whatever happened was they did this terrible thing, and what they now deserve is your wrath, and they deserve it. But what you give them instead, and you wouldn't be wrong to do this. Remember, this is a holy God who would do this perfectly and justly. But instead of doing this, what you do is you lavish them with love and, and gifts. And you tell them, this is going to be paid for. And it's going to be paid for, you know, and we go Christian on this, Jesus Christ. So this is where we get grace from. You aren't given grace by God because he's just, he just, he just, that's his way he is. God is wrathful over sin. God hates the wicked every day. And yet, God provided a sacrifice so that he could be just and the justifier. Remember, this was from Romans earlier, um, to the faithful. So that what he's able to do is say, I can extend grace and mercy to you without violating my justice. That's a, I hate to use the word trick, but that's quite the thing to figure out how to do. And it was a great expense to himself that he does this. There's a, I guess it's an acronym, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. It's a little, I'm not crazy about it. It sounds a little too cheap, but it's, it gets it, you know, so it, it's, it's, it is at Christ's expense. The Trinity working together for our salvation. So grace gives, grace is given only because of the righteousness of Christ for us. And it depends on faith in Christ, not law. Not by obeying the law. You cannot be saved by doing good things because the standard is perfect holiness. It's by what standard? I'm a good person. Great. By what standard? I'm sure by certain standards, you're good. But by a holy standard of God, there are none who are good. No, not one. Born in sin. And this is called uh, radical corruption. You, know, you may be familiar with the... Uh, because we're studying the canons of Dort in the men's Bible study, and that's where you get the, the tulip, which only came about in the, um, I think, early 1900s or late 1800s, where T is total depravity. But um, total depravity is not a good word. It just was created so it makes a good, makes the tulip. So if you use radical corruption, it becomes rulip. And so that's no good. So, but it, radical corruption, what radical corruption means is a radical means the root. There's a, there is a corruption of the human person in the root of their being, born in sin, so that not one baby is born without this sin nature that's in them, so that we sin out of this nature. We don't, we, we don't come into this world perfect and holy, and then we are stained by sin. We come stained, and what comes out of us is, is sin, so that we aren't just sinners because we sin, but we sin because we're sinners. And this is what has to be dealt with by God. So it's in Christ, and only in Christ, that we can be cleansed and changed. So the wrath of God comes from the law, but the promise of God through faith rests on grace, and third, wrath, rest, and life. Because this is where Paul is going to this, is where do we find life? So verse 17, um, you might have a hyphen in there. It goes, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that, that do not exist. God brings life to the dead. Don't pass over that. That's quite remarkable. Okay, The whole Frankenstein thing was about taking a dead person, people, and <laughs> bringing that to life. Life! I've created life! Some you know, famous little line where the scientist, it's alive, it's alive. It's like, yeah, that's science fiction. That's crazy. You can't do that. God did that. God spoke all things into existence. He created life, and he can bring life from death. It's obvious something that God can do. Only God can do. And so, God brings life. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, And you were dead 
in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the path of this world, the prince of the power of the air. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. You weren't a very difficult project to work on. You weren't a very unclean item that we had to work on for a very long time to clean you. This is the problem with purgatory. Okay, Purgatory is this unbiblical idea that you're going to, after you die, continue to pay for your sins over time so that you can, you can get the rest of you cleaned up. The sin that you got after you got baptized, it's, it's this whole thing. It's like, but the idea being that even if you had eternity to pay for your sins, you couldn't do it. Because your goodness doesn't wipe out your sin. And your sin can never be totally paid for where God would finally say, it's enough, it's finished. Only in Christ is he able to say, it is finished. Only in Christ. And so we have to be aware that our deadness means that God brought us back to life. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. The dry bones. I apologize last week. I said, turn with me to Exodus 17. And you, you, should, you read my mind and should have realized we're in Ezekiel. But whatever. So sometimes that happens. But in Ezekiel, prophesy over these dry bones. Dry bones. They're not, they've been there a long time. They're, you know, maybe they're fossils or something. Anyway, breathe over them. Prophesy over them. They come together into a great army. And this is what God is saying. This is what happens when the gospel is preached. Jesus says, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, hell, being the word Sheol, which means death in Hebrew and in Aramaic where he's talking, is that the gates of the dead. There are dead people kept. You know, you go to a, a cemetery or a graveyard and they've got gates up. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> analogically, it's like what you're doing is, it's like Jesus is leading us forward, crashing those gates. It's not like the gates of hell. We kind of think about hell's attacking, hell's attacking, and we're in this defensive position. He's like, I'm going in there and I'm dragging people out. And that doesn't sound like something we probably want to do tonight, but, and I would suggest doing it at night if you choose to, but what it is, is I'm going in there and these people are coming to life. And this is where I got you from. This is the thing. That's where you came from, from the place of the dead. And we've been brought to life in Christ Jesus. Now, this is important because in verse 19, we read that Abraham did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Now, if you're about 100 years old, he's talking about having children. This guy's gone 100 years, and he's been married, and he hasn't had children. It's not looking good, okay, at this point. Even with modern medical science, he's thinking this isn't looking good. His body was as good as dead. And when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, now if you have an ESV, they got a little bit of one and a little bit of one. So as you go to a footnote, and it says deadness in Greek, why they changed it to barrenness, I don't know. A lot of other translations do not do that. It, it says when he considered the deadness that Sarah's womb was dead. Now that is an unusual word for that's not like you think, oh, well, that's what they called barrenness in Greek. No, it's not. They had another word for it. He intentionally used this word saying Abraham's as good as dead and Sarah's womb as good as dead. And yet no unbelief made him waver concerning God's the promise of God. So then if you skip down to verse um, 24, um, this was also counted for our sake. It will also be counted to us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. So this death is important that <clears throat> Abraham is good as dead. Sarah's womb is good as dead. Jesus was dead. And then we read in verse 17 that God gives life to the dead. That's where the amen should come into your heart. It's a, the amen. It can come out of your mouth if you want to. We're Presbyterians, but we get over it. It's, it's amen. This is amen that God brings life to the dead. He calls into existence the things that do not exist. He's talking about our faith, our righteousness, his church. That God calls these things into existence. So we have wrath, rest, life, and then growth. And in verse 19, <clears throat> He did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. 
No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Faith takes growth. Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and then faith grew. So your faith isn't perfect when it starts, and we know the verse, if your faith was as, as the size of a mustard seed, you could you know, do great things. But Abraham himself, his faith also grew. God grows our faith. You follow God for long, and your faith will be tested. Amen? I hope you can say amen. I hope you're not so scared to say that I've, all, I've been challenged in my faith at times because I don't want to hear God to hear me. I don't want anybody else to hear me say that sometimes I have to go, God, are you really good? God, are you really there? God, are you really for me? God, are you really doing these things? God, are you? Because this is what happens in the testing of your faith. The dross comes off of it. So we believe certain things about God and then we go through something that butts up against what we believe and what we have to go say is either God's a liar or I got something wrong here. And guess which one it is. And you don't have to guess if you've been through it because what you figure out or are figuring out is when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the way you say, I will fear no evil, talking about a future thing, it's because you've been there before. I've been in the valley of the shadow of death. Why do I fear no evil? Because... Even as I look back, you were with me. You were with me. And there may even be such difficult things in your life that have grown you and grown your faith that you might say, even at this point, and some of you may be young enough, you're not far enough away from things yet, or something hasn't happened and you get through it and you come out the other side and you say, I'm glad I went through it. Don't make me go through that again. But I'm glad I went through it because... The design was that the fiery trials were to consume the stuff that was not him. It's kind of like when um, da, da, da Vinci, he's a friend of mine in Haiti, Da Vinci, Leonardo, um, was going to you know, carve um, David out of this, you know, the stone. He said all he did was just chip away what wasn't the statue. And that's what God does in our lives. He just chips away what's not Christ-like. And when that happens, sometimes it's most pleasant. Something wonderful happens. It's like, oh, God's so good. And, you, and, you, and you're excited. And you're like realizing how good he is in spite of things. And then sometimes it's because you go through something that feels like you have been slammed down one more time, one more time, one more time, one more time. I can't deal with it. I can't. And then the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, gets inside of you a little deeper and a little bit differently. And your faith grows. If you didn't need him, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you anyway. I mean, you can do all things anyway. You don't really need Christ for it because you're very tough and strong. You know, if God wants to show you, you do need me, then what's he going to do? He's going to add a little weight to your bar that you can't quite handle, and you, then you'll call for somebody to spot you. That's what that means. Do with that analogy as you will. But you know what I mean? It's like he's going to do things, bring things into your life to help you recognize one. You can't do it by yourself. You need other people. You need other Christians. You need him. And... So don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you because it's for the testing and perfecting of your faith. But after the test, your faith has grown and you're stronger in the faith. God tells 100-year-old Abraham, who's had no children, you're going to have a son. And in Genesis 17, Abraham falls down laughing. Now, for some reason, I'd only remembered Sarah laughing. Because in verse 18, Sarah laughs within herself. And the angels hear her laughing. Says, heard you laugh. I didn't laugh. And she lies about it. Because she realizes it's like, it's not in a laughter like, oh, oh, I'm going to have a baby. You know, it's like, you know, this, this was, uh, I, I love to joke with Miss, Miss Ruby about this. Because Miss Ruby, how old was she? She's, a, she's, she's 80 something, she's upper 80s. And I said, this is how God grows the church. Is through One of the principal ways God grows the church is through the birth of babies. And then you see that, you know, Sarah being so old and having a baby. And Miss Ruby said, well, I'm not signing up for that evangelistic program. 
She's not going to. But neither was they. It wasn't like Sarah's jumping up and down. She's laughing because this is ridiculous. Abraham laughs and falls down laughing. And it's something about his laughter that is interesting because he believed God and it was counting him as righteousness. And it could be that he laughed so hard because he, couldn't, he was overjoyed. At the same time, recognizing the fact that there's no way. Not just because of him, but because of her. And that gets him into a little bit of trouble later as he starts to believe God, but wondering what the, the program is here. And uh, falls down laughing. I just can't get out of it. Something about that. Falling down laughing. You ever fell down laughing? I mean, that's a, that's a laugh there. Fell down laughing. And Sarah laughs within herself and she's fussed out a little bit. But God's response to both are the same both times. He says, you're going to name him laughter. Yitzhak, Isaac, Hebrew. You're going to name him laughter. He's falling down laughing. You're going to name him laughter. Sarah laughs within herself. Yes, you did. You're going to name him laughter. So it's like, ha, 24 years later, he is conceived. 24 years later, after you've been told this, 24, now how old are you? You know, you, 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 a quarter century more has gone on. Hasn't happened. Abraham's wheels start turning. He's believing, but he's like, maybe. So if you know the story, you kind of see what happens. Because 24 years later, little laughter is born. Who's laughing now? And it's not Hagar and Ishmael, if you know the story. But this was all in God's plan. And it was all for his glory. Faith does not equal moral perfection. Faith is not perfected with your becoming a better person and doing better. That's not, the perfecting of your faith is not morality. So we're going to look at that these last few minutes. But what faith does, because faith doesn't equal moral perfection. It didn't for Abraham and it doesn't for us, but faith clings to and follows the perfect one, Jesus Christ. 24 years and God could have done it in less than one. God grows our faith. And why does he do it? For his glory, that we might glorify him, that our faith might grow and therefore, point five, glory. And what's being glorified is God here. Verse 20. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Now notice, it wasn't when his faith grew strong, then he gave glory to God. He was giving glory to God in the instant of his believing. All along the way. And as he gave glory to God, he grew strong in his faith, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So this fully convinced comes over time as well as we see him working with Abraham as he works with us. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. So each way, at each fearful moment, Glorifying God at each misstep and recovery, glorifying God, taking matters into his own hands only to learn that he was wrong and shouldn't have, but was also had that used in his life to increase his faith and to give glory to God by teaching him how to better walk in his ways, how to understand more about God. So to you know, Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number one, what is the chief end of man? What's the man's main purpose and the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever and John Piper I think rightly says it's kind of like this too you glorify God by enjoying him forever you glorify God by saying what he says is good and right for our goodness and his glory by being salt and light the world will see your good deeds as Jesus says your faithful responses to failures and weaknesses too. Your actions based on your faith in God. And they will bring glory to God the Father as we point to him with our deeds. Wrath 
rest, life, growth, glory, and finally, assurance. Do you know that if you were to die right now, that you would go to heaven? And how sure are you of it? And then the next question would be, what do you think is required for you? You know, there's the famous evangelism explosion question. If you die a day, and you, would you, you believe you go to heaven. And if you were to stand before God in heaven, he would say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your response be? And it's only and ever because of Jesus Christ in my place. Jesus for me, I in him, he in me. Um, it's all Jesus Christ, my faith in him, which he gave me as a gift when he called me from death to life. Nothing in my hands I bring, but I'm clothed in his righteousness. Trusting in him alone for our salvation. Trusting in the promises of God. This is what you do. Trusting in the promises of God and trusting in these verses, beginning in verse 20. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why... His faith was counted, it means credited to him, his account, to him as righteousness. But these words, and this is where it's got to say, do you believe this? Is this what you're clinging to? These words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but also for ours. Now he's writing of including himself and these people at that time, but he's still saying ours, ours. These are written for your, for our sake. So that it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our, for our justification. So he's delivered up, and that's called the um, divine, oh, what is it? It's the divine, oh, I can't think of the word for it, but it, the divine passive. God, he was delivered up by God. God the Father. He's already made this point before. This is who God delivered his own son. Jesus willingly went to the cross to because of our sin. But he was raised for our justification. So somebody breaks a window. Somebody else offers to pay for it. You have a decision to make. You can accept the payment or you can say, no, he's going to jail. And in the resurrection of Christ, God said, I accept this. And as proof, I am raising him from the dead. So that all who are in him have also been forgiven and are raised from the dead. They have, it was enough, and it is enough, and it is accepted. And therefore, he is raised from the dead. So we all understand that we're not saved by our obedience to the law. But sometimes we measure whether or not we have saving faith based on our obedience to the law. How do I know I'm saved? Well, by works. You're not saved by works, but how do I know I have faith? I can see your faith by things you do. James says it. Show me your your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. What is your faith based on? Your works? James didn't say that. He is saying there's these things, but he's not having faith in his works, because that can put you right back in the same spot Trusting in your own obedience to know whether you're saved. The only question, the only standard is this. Do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in his life, death, resurrection for your salvation? Do you know the grace and goodness and mercy of God? And we often learn these things from our failures and sins and hardships. And also in the joys that we see, knowing that they're undeserved and evidences of our loving God and Father. So, just real quick, in closing, I'm going to look at two psalms, briefly, and of, of David. I know Psalm 119 may not be a Davidic psalm, but uh, it expresses what he would believe, and it's the Holy Spirit um, inspiring these things. So, Psalm 119, it's um, pretty close to the middle of your Bible. It's, some people, it's uh, the longest of the psalms. We're going to start just at verse 1, not going through the whole thing, just the very beginning here to say, this is a love letter for the law. Okay? Law can't save you, so what's the deal with it? It's good. It doesn't mean that the law is not good, but if you're using it for salvation, law is not good. You know, it says 55 out there. You're going to be better off driving the speed limit. You break the speed limit, you're now guilty. 
So we're not depending on the law to save us, to declare our righteousness. But it is good. The law is good. So what we're going to look at is, is just look at Psalm 119.1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. I think I can do this quick. Two primary words for blessing in Hebrew, in the Old Testament. Asher, Asher, and the other one is Barak. Yeah, Barak Obama, he's named Blessing. That's where they got it from. So Asher, Asher and Barak. Asher, Blessing, which we see here, is never used on God's lips of somebody else, and it's never used of God. Asher is something, because you do this thing, you're to be congratulated, or you are happy. Things go well for you because you do this. And so Asher, blessed, are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You've commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Because there's blessing in this. Then, if you look at verse Uh, come on, come on, come on. All right, I, I will not look forever. It says, blessed are you, O God. And that word, here it is, verse 12, 119, 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Now that is the word Barak. You are, it's a benediction. And so when God says you are blessed, and there is blessing. When God blesses you, it is not something that you're being approved on, but it's a benediction. It is, bless you, my child. Bless you. May this blessing come upon you in spite of yourself because of who I am. The other is, there's great blessing in keeping the law. So David loved the law. The psalmist loved the law. And so we're supposed to love the law. But now here's the problem with loving it unto salvation is Psalm 73. And it's not the problem, it's the solution. So when you hear Psalm 73, you have a person writing this. This is a psalm of Asaph. It says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. My, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant. You know what? Psalm 51. That one works too, but Psalm 51 is the one I was thinking about. So try again. Here we go. Psalm 51. I love your law. It brings great blessing. You are blessed, O Lord, for giving it to us. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. He's transgressed that law. I love it. Look what I've done. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgression. My sin is there before you against you, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You will be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and in inward being, and you teach me wisdom in my secret place. Purge me with hyssop. He's like, do something. Do something, do something, and then I'll be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praises for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You would be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a contrite heart. God, you will not despise these things. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. I love your law and I have violated and broken it. Purge me and make me clean. And in Jesus Christ, that's what we see. We have broken his law. We plead out for forgiveness. And in Christ Jesus, it's been granted and given. And he says, you're mine and I'm yours. And what you get when you hear this gospel as a believer is Jesus Christ comes more into your life. You apply this in your darknesses and in your trials. You become more Christ-like. This is why he gives us the Lord's Supper. He says, take and eat. You need me, and I give myself to you. You don't come to this table because you're, you got, 
because you're sinless. You come to it because you're not. You don't stay away from the table because you have hidden sin. Yes, you have hidden sin. Come to the table and deal with it and let God say, I'm yours. I love you. Believe the promises. I'm giving myself to you. Walk from here, fed by me, new in me, and you are clean. It's the forgiveness and the growth where we, whereby we can glorify him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your grace, mercy, gift of Christ, this, this Lord's Supper we have, our time together. Thank you for these things. We pray that you would help us to cling more closely to your promises, believing that you bring life from death and that you will continue to grow our faith. And we thank you for this, this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.